Uh, one other uh, factor is ionic radius. So this is the same as atomic radius. We already talked about the size of the atom and the factors that affect that. Right? For the size of the atom, the factors that affect it are the quantity of positive charge in the nucleus, more positive charge, smaller atom. That's also true for ions. The other factor is shielding. More shielding, larger atom because there's more repulsion, right? And we said the shielding was a slightly more important factor and the number of protons is a secondary factor. So we make, if we make the same arguments when we're talking about ions. When we're talking about ions though, we just have to, before we can look at the size, we have to figure out what energy levels the electrons are actually in. Because when we adjust the quantity of electrons to create a charge on an atom, that means we're not going to have the same electrons we would normally have if that atom were neutral. They're not all going to be in the same uh, subshells and things. And so if we have, we have to make sure we're accounting for the electrons that are present in the ion, not necessarily the electrons that would be there for a neutral atom. So to do that, so we'll come back here for, before we do that, I want to mention, oh, I want to talk about this one first. <coughs> so if we want to talk about the size of an ion, we've got to be able to figure out where the electrons are in that ion. So first thing we want to do is to look at electron configurations for ion. So for potassium, so we'll just look at these. For potassium, normally potassium has 19 electrons. And one of those electrons is in the 4s, and I know that because it's in the s block and it's in the fourth row down. But if I'm going to give it a k plus, what does that mean is happening? I'm taking one of the electrons out. And I know that because if they were a balance between positive and negative and I take one of the electrons away, I don't have enough negative to balance out all the positives. That's why I have a, an excess positive charge located there. So if I take one of the electrons out, if you can't tell exactly where that's going to come out of, it might be helpful to draw the electron configuration first. So there's my 19 electrons. And if I'm going to take one out, it's always going to be the valence electron that I take out. So I'm going to be taking out that 4s1. Without that valence electron in there, now my third energy level becomes the valence. And my first two energy levels become the core. That's a lot different from how it was when the electron was still in there that I took out. When I put that electron to the fourth energy level, I've got three core levels then, and, and the fourth energy level is the valence level. So I need to think about that. So neon is not an ion in this example. So the neon's configuration is just going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. If we look at argon, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. Kr one more level, okay, I have 36 electrons, and then if we go to P3 minus, if we have a minus charge, we're putting extra electrons in. And if we have a 3 minus, we're putting three extra electrons in. So the normal electron configuration for phosphorus, it's going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p3, right? Because it's the 1, 2, 3, third element over in the p block of the third row. If I'm putting three more electrons in, where are they going to go? They're going to go into the 3p. I'm going to fill that up before I go to the next energy level. Sulfur has a minus 2. So sulfur 2 minus has the same number of electrons as a phosphorus 3 minus. So it's going to have the same electron configuration. And the same thing for the Cl minus. The Cl minus 1 is going to have also the same electron configuration. So we've got to be able to look at the electron configurations if we're judging the size. So we'll come back to that here in a minute. So just to point out how the size has changed, obviously, Anytime I add more electrons, the size is going to get larger. So the white half circle here represents 
the size of the sphere with the extra electrons compared to the red one, which was before when it was neutral. And for my, um, <coughs> for my uh, metals here, the blue half circle represents the size of the sphere when it was neutral, and the white, again, represents the charged. Okay? So what happens to all of my ones that lose electrons is they get way smaller. Why are they getting smaller? They get smaller because two reasons. What? So I probably don't want to word it that way because I'm not changing the number of protons. So the number of protons is still having the same attraction. What I'm changing is the shielding. So since I have less shielding, less repulsion, that's a more straightforward way of saying what you were already saying. I have less shielding, less repulsion, so the remaining electrons feel the attraction to a greater extent. And for these ones, as they're shown on the table, in addition to that, and this isn't always the case, but most of the time, a metal loses the number of electrons that's equal to the number of valence electrons it had to begin with. That's why the elements in group 1A are losing one electron and becoming a plus one. The elements in group 2A are losing two electrons and become a plus two. And aluminum's losing three electrons and become a plus three. Because that's the number of electrons it loses to reach the same number of electrons as a noble gas. And in order to do that, it loses its entire outer valence level. So that's also, also often a factor. And that's why these positive charges are so much smaller than they would have been when they were neutral, because you often lose an entire energy level. So whatever that valence level was, all those electrons are gone. And now what was the core becomes the valence. That's not always true, but that's often true. And so then we can make the opposite statement for our nonmetals. Nonmetals get larger when they gain electrons, and that's because they have more shielding. And that's pretty much it. They're usually not going to, when nonmetals gain electrons, they'll usually gain the number they need to fill up whatever the valence level was that was already there. They're not going to fill that up and add a whole other level. That's not going to be stable. It's not impossible, it's just not a stable arrangement for the electrons. So we won't really see many examples like that. So the main thing there is the extra shielding due to the uh, added electrons. Questions about that? So here's uh, one other term that you should be familiar with. Iso is a prefix that's used a lot in chemistry. Iso means same. So isoelectronic means the same number of electrons. So isoelectronic series would be comparing a number of atoms with the same electron configuration same number of electrons. So if I, if I compare these three atoms, they all have a total of 10 electrons, eight of which are valence electrons. So how do I judge their sizes? And these atoms are shown with their relatively si uh, the sizes that are relative uh, to the sizes of the atoms. So this one is large and this one is smaller. What's the explanation there? Why are the sizes of those three different? If they have the same number of electrons, wouldn't the electrons be in the same energy levels, the same distances away? Why aren't they all the same size? Good. Good. Everyone, everyone got that one. At least a bunch of people did. It has to do not just with where the electrons are, but how many protons there are. So when I have a greater quantity of positive charge, that attracts the electrons closer, and so that's why that one's smaller. 
So for isoelectronic atoms, everything's the same except the number of protons. So that's the only factor we can use to determine which is going to pull the electrons closer. So if we look at our example here then, if we're trying to rank the sizes of these atoms, we've got a long list here that we want to rank, we've got to look at the factors, right? The first factor we said was shielding, and the second factor was the number of protons. So we want to look at shielding first. Regardless of whether the atom is charged, negative, positive, or whether it's not charged and it's neutral, the shielding is the factor that we look at. So anything that has more shielding should be a larger element, or atom, or ion. So which of these is going to be the largest? Yes, the krypton, because it's the only one that has valence electrons in the fourth energy level. And it's those fourth energy le uh, level electrons are shielded by three levels. That's a lot of shielding. So those that shielding is going to repel and push the fourth energy electrons for krypton out. So KR is going to be the largest one here. I know the book focus focuses a lot on the fact that when atoms gain electrons, they get larger. They're not necessarily going to be larger than other atoms just because they've gained electrons. We still have to look at the shielding first. So the next thing we would look at uh, what else What else does the shielding tell us here? What else can we rank just based on shielding? Yes, we could say neon should be the smallest because there's only one level of shielding, shielding the valence electrons in neon. All the other ones have roughly the same amount of shielding because they all have, well actually all the other ones have the same amount of shielding because they all have the exact same number of electrons. So that's not going to be a factor there. The K plus, the argon, the P minus 3, the S2 minus, and the Cl minus are all isoelectronic. So if they all have the same number of electrons and the same degrees of shielding, even if they didn't have the exact same shielding but they had similar amounts of shielding, we would have to look at the protons to distinguish. So 19 protons versus 18 protons versus 17, 16, 15. That's what we'll use to rank them. Right? So more protons hold the electrons closer it's going to make it into a smaller atom. So we could say then the K plus will be next smallest with 19, and then the argon with 18, and then the Cl minus with 17, and then the S2 minus with 16, and then the P3 minus with 15. Questions about that? All right, um, I think you guys should be able to do 68. I did want to do one that's actually not in here to point out one aspect of that. So when you're doing electron configurations for ions, what I want to point out is when you have a transition metal that becomes an ion, Electrons are removed, well I should say valence electrons are removed, not D subshell electrons. Okay? So just for example, if we look at ruthenium, ruthenium's uh, electron configuration would be starting with KR if we wanted to abbreviate it. And then after KR we're into the fifth energy level, so we do a 5s2, and then ruthenium would have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 electrons in the f uh, 4d so that would be a ruthenium, and what we find for transition metals in this d block is a lot of them exist naturally with a plus 2 charge and the reason for that is because they have two valence electrons. And if they lose those two valence electrons, then since those valence electrons experience so much shielding from all these inside levels, those two valence electrons are not held in tightly and other atoms can pull them away and attract them better sometimes. So if I were to make a ruthenium 2 plus, 
that would be equal to a KR and then a 4D6. So I'm losing the valence electrons, the ones with the higher principal energy level number. You might also predict that ruthenium could come often with the three plus charge. Why is that? Right. If I did that, then I would take obviously the first two valence electrons out of the fifth energy level and then the third electron would come out of the 4D and I would have 4D5 which is exactly half full. And so that's also a situation you might see. So when you're trying to decide what the charge on the transition metal might be, it's usually whatever the charge you get when you take the valence electrons out first and then maybe you might take some of the D electrons out to make the subshell exactly half full or something like that. Uh, 4.72. So those are, I would, I would do that. So I would, I would work on these. Make sure you can do these electron configurations for um, main group elements and for transition metals. Um, let's just do one of the examples in 4.74. This is a slightly different way that you might see a question asked. So I want to make sure you guys are prepared for that. Um, so we'll look at C. So here the question says, I've got an ion with the net charge of plus one, and I've got the electron configuration of KR 5s2 4d10. So we did uh, this before but with neutral atoms and what we said was we're going to count up the number of electrons if I want to know what element this is I count up the number of electrons so KR is 36 electrons plus the two electrons in the 5s plus the 10 electrons in the 4d that gives me 46 plus 2 48 total electrons right so normally I would say that would be cadmium but if I have 48 electrons and I say cadmium, that would be 48 protons. So that would be for a neutral atom. But if I have an ion, I don't have a neutral atom. So the answer here is not cadmium. So what I need to do is to recognize I definitely know I have 48 electrons because I just counted them up. If I have 48 electrons but I have an extra positive charge, how many protons must I have? 49. So this is indeed an, uh, an element of indium, and it would, its symbol would be indium plus. So you should be able to do that. And 4.78, I also recommend practicing that one. That one. I'm not going to go over it. It's pretty straightforward. It's just a matter of drawing orbital diagrams and when you have a charge either putting extra electrons in or taking extra electrons out and seeing how many of those electrons are unpaired. So most of you guys were able to do that on the, on the exam for neutral atoms so it shouldn't be a problem for you to adjust to doing that for ions. Um, so that's it for chapter four. So also practice these ones. Check your answers in the back of the book. We'll start off class next time by seeing if you have any questions about these practice questions. And then um, <clears throat> for next time, uh, be prepared for chapter 5, sections 1 through 9. That's what we're going to do in the next class. Okay? Any questions about any of that? All right. Um,